at a gang.
Shamika is here. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. There we go. Hello, this is Genesis McPherson. I just got on here. Gotcha. Can you add Zenep too? Okay. Z e i n e p. There you go. Thank you. Gotcha. Lily's here. All right, Walker's here. Walker. Mr. Converse, um, Raymond Wilson would like to know what's the um, ID number. Oh, it's just nut 100, the password, all caps. Okay. You, you talk about the meeting ID? Yes. The meeting ID is, hold on. Uh, I just texted to her. Yeah, it's, it's the same as always been. Okay. Yeah. Tawana Crawley here. Yeah, I got you. Okay. Lauren Raven here. Raven here. There we go. Jordan. Harris. Okay. Walker. All right. Waiting on Beckham, Ellis, Frazier, McGee, Roper, Tamang, and Thomas. Um, they probably have come on in a few minutes. I know there were some people asking uh our other teacher a few questions after he had got done. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Well, I got he end at 10 30 and you come in at 10 30. So it's like right back. There we go. It's Frazier. Yeah, Frazier. 
I'm, okay, I see. I just got got on. Thank you. Okay, hold on. Stephanie's here. Stephanie's here. There we go. We need Erica, Zarian, Terry, Sheila, and Carmesha. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we'll go ahead and start and the rest will trickle in. Um, I haven't posted the exam results yet because I still have some people waiting to take the exam. So uh, as soon as they submit, then I can go ahead and put your scores in. Um, the topics today are, um, we're going to be doing digestive disorders and renal disorders, okay? So since we just kind of finished talking about the digestive system, I think it's a good idea to go into digestive disorders first. And I sent you guys um, the notes, so you should have those in the email so that you can type as I talk and make notes, okay? Um, your digestive system, remember, is a basically a pipe that goes from the oral cavity all the way to the anus, and it has accessory glands that help it function, right? The teeth, the tongue, the salivary glands, the liver, the gallbladder, the pancreas all help out, right? Um, the major components are the oral cavity, the throat, which is the pharynx, the esophagus, which connects the pharynx to the stomach. The stomach connects to the small intestine, which connects to the large intestine, which is going to connect to the rectum and the anus. All right. And if we have a problem with function anywhere along the way, then you're going to see symptoms. Okay. Um, usually when there's inflammation, all right, um, in the digestive system, one of the things that you're going to experience is a condition known as nausea and vomiting. So what is this exactly? Well, I mean, we, we probably all experienced it, right? Nausea, you feel ill at ease and vomiting, which is the technical term is emesis, you throw up. What's the purpose of it though? The purpose of it is to get rid of whatever the irritant is, okay? So the idea is that we're trying to get out of you whatever it is that was inside you that was causing the problem. So that could be a toxin, that could be a pathogen, okay? So this is the body's way of trying to clean you out, all right? The other reason that you throw up is because you take in too much food at one time, right? And that is essentially a way to um, keep the stomach from rupturing, right? You don't want to stuff more material in there than the stomach can actually hold, okay? Also, there are the potential for allergies, right? The allergy is basically an immune response to something in your food and it causes inflammation. And that usually is going to initiate nausea and vomiting, okay? The purpose of an allergic reaction is actually your immune system trying to protect you from something that really isn't harmful, okay? So that's why some people, for instance, have peanut allergies or pollen allergies. Those things aren't really bad for you. It's just that your immune system is set up so that when it sees those particular compounds inside your body, it attacks them too vigorously. And when it does that, it releases chemicals like histamine, and that's what causes the inflammation. Okay. So a whole list of possible causes, right? You've got viral infection, bacterial infection, uh, problems with any of the uh, accessory organs of digestion. Um, the underlying cause is what we need to address, okay? Um, the appearance of the emesis will help us, right? For instance, if you are throwing up and we see something that looks like coffee grounds, that indicates that there might be blood in there because when the blood reacts with the stomach acid, it turns black, okay? Um, and that could indicate something like an ulcer somewhere, okay? Pale green indicates we've got bile in there, all right? So that could indicate a problem 
with the gallbladder, okay? Once the symptoms subside, we start with clear liquids and then full liquids and then advance to a tolerable diet. We want easy to digest, low fat, carbohydrate foods like crackers, toast, and oatmeal. Those are usually well tolerated. Clients should stop liquids with meals because they promote a feeling of fullness. Promote good oral hygiene with toothbrushing and mouth swabs. Now, the reason for this is that the acid in the emesis is going to erode your enamel in your teeth, okay, as well as um, run the risk of damaging your esophagus and your throat and oral cavity, right? You want to raise the head of the bed so that you don't choke on the emesis, right? And you want to discourage hot and spicy foods because they're going to damage you coming back up. Serve foods at room temperature or chilled and avoid high fat foods if they cause the nausea because they're tougher to digest. They take longer to break down than carbohydrates and proteins do, okay? So there's a whole bunch of different causes for nausea and vomiting. One of the risks, if this goes on too long, in addition to damaging the esophagus and the throat and the oral cavity is an imbalance in fluid and electrolytes, especially in children. And so we have to make sure that we maintain those either by giving them to you or by putting them in you in IV, okay? If you're, if you're experiencing excessive diarrhea and vomiting, we have to restore your fluid and electrolyte balance or we're gonna see problems in the nervous system and in the muscular system, okay? And that's not good for you. This is a little bit about anorexia. I think that anorexia is a death wish, really. It's, it's, it's suicide, and I felt like it was the most natural suicide possible. I was in the like, angst of teenage like hell, thinking everything was awful and I needed to die, and it felt powerful because I think like your junior year of high school, you're really busy, and I had that extra hour during lunch when everyone would be sitting around eating. I could go and do more work because I didn't have to eat because I was so much better than everyone else. I think the final moment when I decided, okay, I need help, was they were going to hospitalize me because I wasn't eating at all. And I had dropped, I mean, I'm five foot seven and I'm medium boned. And I dropped from like 117 pounds to like 98, I think, in a couple of weeks. And I sing, I'm studying singing. And the doctor was telling me, you know, what do you think your vocal, what, what do you think makes you sing? And it's muscle. And your body has no fat and it's eating your muscle now. And the most important thing to me in the world was singing. So I was like, oh God, I can't, I can't do this. I can't destroy what I love the most. And so then I realized I have to get help for this. I don't think that I need to lose weight anymore. I, I you know, I've come a long way. I'd rather put on weight, but I do have days. It's such a power thing. It really is a power thing where if I'm stressed, whether it's a family stress or anything, not eating makes me feel powerful. If somebody had told me when I was like all the way back in the beginning of all this, that if I lost weight and gained weight and lost weight and gained weight, I was going to get, you know, horrible stretch marks that I was going to lose all my hair because it was just going to fall out, that my skin was going to get dry and gross, that my eyes were going to like go back into their sockets. I'd have constant dark circles that no concealer could cover up. If someone had told me how ugly I looked being that thin, I wouldn't have done it. I mean, it, it was part beauty and part power, you know, but it's just like when I put on weight, I'm healthy. I look better. Everything works better. I can concentrate in class. I don't lose my concentration. I mean, there were days when I would be so weak that I couldn't get out of bed to go to school. And it's just, it's not worth it. So this is a, this is a body image disorder. This is a psychological eating disorder in which you undergo voluntary starvation. Okay. Um, it's uh, a common finding for numerous physical conditions and is an adverse effect of meds as well. Sometimes there are certain meds you take and make you don't want to eat. It's not the same as anorexia nervosa. Anorexia can lead to decreased nutritional intake and subsequent protein and calorie deficits. So there's psychological manifestations that can bring this on. There are drug manifestations that can drink, bring this on. Um, what do we do as a nursing intervention? We want to decrease stress. 
not just at meal time, but all the time. We want to gather data about the adverse effects of any meds. We want to give meds to stimulate appetite, modify the environment for unpleasant odors so that they can be eliminated, remove items that reduce appetite, okay? Basically make, make the environment amenable to wanting to eat, okay? Manage anxiety and depression, right? And along with this goes counseling. Give small frequent meals and stop high fat foods to maximize intake. Give liquid supplements between meals and improve protein and calorie intake because we have to build up muscle, right? You're, when you starve yourself, one of the things that your body does is it goes to your protein stores in your body. Most of that is your muscle and you begin to experience muscle wasting. So we have to put the protein back in order to stop that process. We want to make sure that the meals are appealing to the person eating them, and we want to check for changes in bowel status, such as increased gastric emptying, constipation, or diarrhea. We want to position the patient to increase gastric motility, which means usually a modified Fowler's position in bed, okay? And we want to give mouth care before and after meals, and again, this is because uh, with reduced digestive uh, participation, you're going to have reduced saliva production and you're going to have a uh, greater risk of uh, breakdown of the enamel on the teeth because the bacteria in there aren't getting flushed out as easily with the saliva production, right? So you're going to be prone to cavities and gingivitis and other types of um, problems with the teeth and the gums. In constipation, what happens is that the the fecal material moves through the colon too slowly and too much water gets taken out as a result in the colon and it becomes a very solid mass that's difficult to pass, okay? So what can cause this? Well, risk factors include obesity and pregnancy and old age, okay? Um, also irregular bowel habits, psychogenic problems, inactivity, chronic laxative use, blockage, that's a big one, okay, whether it be functional or structural, and medications that can slow the uh, passage of the fecal material through the colon. IBS is a risk, okay, trauma, and inadequate consumption of fiber and fluid. So one of the things that can happen in the digestive system is that um, one of the things that occurs as we get older is that our the muscle that pushes the material through the pipe gets weaker. And so it gets less effective at doing its job, which means that the passage of the material through the pipe slows to the point where you can pull too much water out of the feces and they become almost a mineral. We call those things fecaliths. That's basically clinical speak for poop rocks and they can become what we call a structural block in the colon and then stuff can build up behind that and the colon can swell up and that is a condition known as megacolon and the risk of course is that the colon could rupture. So we have to go in and we have to remove the obstruction, okay? Sometimes we can go in through the rectum and the anus and remove it. Sometimes we have to resort to other types of surgery because we can't get it out that way. Um, the functional block occurs when the peristalsis along the pipe stops. The, the muscle movements that push the food are triggered by nerve impulses and there are certain diseases where those nerve impulses get shut down. And so the material just stops moving at a certain point and the same thing happens, which is that the, the, uh, the pipe will swell up upstream of the block and runs the risk of, of popping, okay? So what we do in that case is that we remove the part of the intestine that isn't functioning and we rejoin the two ends and restore flow. Usually when we do that, the resection is going to be uh, diverted into something uh, called, uh, you're going to basically poop into a bag. We call that a colostomy or an ileostomy, okay? And then a second surgery, if we have enough pipe left over, will rejoin where the ostomy is to the rectum and the anus so that we can restore flow, right? Sometimes we don't have enough 
um, bowel left to do that, okay? And if that's the case, um, then the, the colostomy is going to be a permanent condition. Um, the other uh, risk factors are basically problems with your diet. You need to have adequate fiber in your diet so that you can pull enough fluid into the fecal material to soften it so that you can pass it, okay? That's why as we get older, we increase the fiber content in our diet, um, but it's a good habit to get into even when you're younger, okay? Um, medications that kill pain sometimes slow down the passage of fecal material through the pipe. Examples include things like Oxycontin, okay? So sometimes if you go in for a surgery or a painful procedure and they give you Oxycontin, they'll sometimes give you a laxative to go with it so that you don't end up um, terribly constipated. So what are the nursing interventions? We want to determine the onset and duration of the elimination patterns and what's normal for the client, okay? Um, we want to take into account their dietary intake, their occupation, their stress levels. And we want to collect data about their history, get a patient history. We want to know what they're taking, right? What are your over-the-counters and what are your prescriptions? And we want to check for the presence of rectal pressure or fullness and abdominal pain and tell the client to increase their fiber intake. Um, an increase in fiber is the preferred treatment as opposed to laxatives that work in a different fashion, right? Laxatives can soften the stool a number of different ways. One of the ways that um, certain laxatives work is to increase the peristaltic rate, basically to speed up the, um, the, the flow through the colon, right? And so you, as a result of that, retain more water and make it easier to pass. Um, that has a risk, which is that you can lose too much fluid and electrolytes. So if we can get by with the fiber treatment, that's usually uh, a more effective uh, way to go. One of the old treatments, for instance, for colic was to give the baby uh, molasses. And the reason for that was that the molasses didn't digest terribly well, would make it all the way to the colon and then would act to pull water into the feces through osmosis and make it easier for the baby to poop, okay? Diarrhea is just the opposite. In diarrhea, what's happening is that the, the fecal material is going through too fast. And the result is that too much water is in the feces. And so you lose not only the fecal material, but you lose water and electrolytes. So this can cause you to, to dump potassium, sodium. It can cause nutritional problems. Um, what causes diarrhea? Well, again, this is often an, a response to an irritant in the tract, right? So if you've got something in the bowel or even in the, in the small intestine, a toxin or, or a, a pathogen of some type, the diarrhea is the body's natural response to try and flush it, okay? Um, but the problem is it can become too extensive and you can get into problems with fluid and electrolyte balance. Um, other reasons for diarrhea include malabsorption disorders like lactose intolerance, as well as certain medications. And so a high fiber diet provides mass, all right? And that allows you to slow the rate of loss of fluid and electrolytes, unless it's the fiber that's actually causing the diarrhea. So we wanna check for fluid and electrolyte loss and then nutrition therapy can either be a change in their actual diet, or we might need to put them in severe cases on IV, okay, parenteral nutrition. Okay. Dysphagia is a difficulty in swallowing, right? The muscles that let you swallow are skeletal muscles, and they're around the throat and in the oral cavity, okay? Uh, problems include obstruction and inflammation, and certain problems with innervation of those muscles, okay? Changing the texture of the food and the consistency can let the client more easily ingest. Dry mouth is a problem, and some medications reduce saliva production, and so we want to evaluate those and see if you're having an adverse effect. Clients usually have uh, dysphagia um, accompanied with an increased risk of aspiration, meaning that they can 
get something in their windpipe and they could potentially choke, right? So the, the client wants to be in a high Fowler's position to facilitate swallowing. For those of you that, that don't remember Fowler's, Fowler's is sitting up with your knees bent in front of you, okay? Um, give oral care prior to eating to allow them to taste their food. Um, the clients um, should have uh, speech therapy uh, in case they're having damage to structures in the oral cavity. Um, and then we want to have um, dietary modifications that make the stuff easier to swallow, right? So not a lot of big, solid, difficult to process foods, right? You want to stop thin liquids and sticky foods because they can be a problem. The nursing interventions allow time for the client to eat. It's going to take longer, right? Small bites, thoroughly chew it. Pills should be taken with at least eight ounces of fluid. And we want to stop meds from remaining in the esophagus. By doing this, this allows us to flush the med down into the stomach where eventually it'll be absorbed into the blood. Nutritional supplements are important if the intake is deemed inadequate. So we can give them... Um, things like high protein uh, shakes and um, other dietary supplements to make it easier for them to get their calories in if eating is such a chore, okay? Now, dumping syndrome is something that occurs when uh, we, we do surgery on the stomach, okay? The stomach normally controls how quickly it sends chyme into the duodenum, but sometimes when the stomach is surgically modified, the stomach will rapidly empty into the small intestine. And the danger with that is that the acid in the stomach with the, with the dump can't be neutralized by the bicarbonate that the pancreas makes to neutralize that acid because there's too much acid coming at once. And so that can erode the duodenum and produce a duodenal ulcer, okay? That's a bleeding sore in the inner lining of the intestine. The danger, of course, with that is that if, it's, if it becomes too extensive, it can perforate, it can make a hole in the small intestine, and then the contents of your, of your stomach can empty into your abdominal pelvic cavity, right? And that's an immediate medical emergency, okay? Um, symptoms usually occur between 15 minutes to half hour after you eat. They include fullness sensation, cramping, nausea, diarrhea, tachycardia, sweating, um, hypotension. Late symptoms between one and three hours include diaphoresis, weakness, tremors, anxiety, nausea, and hunger, right? So you're sweating, you're nauseous, um, you're weak. Symptoms resolve after the intestine empties but there's a rapid rise in blood glucose and an increase in insulin levels right after this happens. And this can lead to hypoglycemia, right? Because when you get a, an insulin spike, the insulin's purpose is to tell tissues in the body to take the sugar out of the blood and use it for fuel. If that happens all at once too much, then your blood sugar levels can drop to the point where you can feel dizzy and nauseous and weak in the knees. So we recommend small frequent meals, eating protein and fat at each meal. Tell the client to stop food that contains concentrated sugar and restrict lactose intake. And that's to, again, deal with the insulin problem um, and also to potentially cut off the risk of lactose intolerance in those that have that condition. Tell the client to consume liquids an hour before or after eating instead of during meals. And tell the client to lie down for 20 to 30 minutes after the meal in order to slow the rate at which the stomach empties. If reflux is a problem, you wanna do a, like a modified Fowler. So that would be like not sitting up, but a, rec a reclining sit with the knees bent, okay? Check clients that are getting enteral tubes and report symptoms of dumping to the provider. An enteral tube is just one that goes into the digestive system and can dump food, for instance, directly into the stomach, okay? Check the client for vitamin and mineral deficits, including things like iron and B12, because those are normally absorbed in the stomach, okay? Those are exceptions to the rule that 
we absorb material mostly in the small intestine. Okay. okay, this is a little bit on GERD. Gastroesophageal reflux disease is also known as reflux or GERD. This occurs when the muscle between the esophagus and the stomach, the lower esophageal sphincter, is weak or relaxes inappropriately. This allows the stomach's contents to back up into the esophagus. Symptoms include heartburn, belching, and regurgitation of food. Most GERD sufferers have frequent severe heartburn that tears down and damages the cell wall lining of the esophagus. Without treatment, GERD can lead to the following conditions. Barrett's esophagus, a precancerous change in the cells lining the esophagus. Esophageal cancer, esophageal perforation, or a hole in the esophagus. Esophageal ulcers, which damage the lining further. Esophagitis, inflammation of the esophagus. Esophageal stricture, a narrowing of the esophagus that interferes with eating. Dietary and lifestyle choices may contribute to GERD. Certain foods and beverages, such as chocolate, fried or fatty foods, coffee, or alcoholic beverages may weaken the lower esophageal sphincter, LES, and cause reflux and heartburn. Studies show that cigarette smoking relaxes the lower esophageal sphincter. Obesity and pregnancy can also cause GERD. Decreasing the size of portions at mealtime may help control symptoms. Eating meals at least two to three hours before bedtime may lessen reflux by allowing the acid in the stomach to decrease and the stomach to empty partially. Treatment for GERD can include medications such as Zantac, Prilosec, and Nexium, as well as surgical procedures. So what's happening in GERD is that while the stomach is churning the bolus with the gastric secretions, some of that mixture is flipping back up into the esophagus and is irritating it, okay? The esophagus isn't set up to deal with stomach acid because it doesn't have any way to neutralize it. So what happens to the esophagus is that it begins to scar and inflame and can convert in some cases to Barrett's esophagus, which can lead to esophageal cancer. So the risk factors, obesity, pregnancy, old age, hiatal hernia, now that's one that you may not have heard of. In a hiatal hernia, what happens is that the, uh, the domed upper portion of the stomach called the fundus pops through the diaphragm and into your chest cavity. And so the diaphragm kind of chokes around that and that can contribute to increased pressure in the stomach and pushing the stomach contents into the esophagus, right? The reason that pregnancy and obesity contribute to it is because the extra weight on the stomach pushes on it and then the food flips back in the wrong direction. And there are some meds that can contribute to this as well. Long-term GERD, like we said, can damage the esophagus. Symptoms include heartburn and retrosternal burning, burning behind your, your breastbone, okay? Swallowing problems, dyspepsia, regurgitation, coughing, hoarseness, epigastric pain, which can be mistaken in some cases for an MI, okay? Um, remember that in an MI, usually the pain is referred to the left jaw, neck, shoulder, and arm, especially in men, right? But some people mistake GERD, which radiates from the chest, as an MI, okay? So what do we tell the client to do? Well, number one, lose the weight if obesity is a contributing factor, right? Stop situations that lead to increased abdominal pressure. So don't wear tight-fitting clothing. Stop eating two hours or less before lying down. Tell the client to raise the body on pillows instead of lying flat. 
and to stop large meals and bedtime snacks. So again, this is a way to cut down on the pressure on top of the stomach, but also to reduce the material in it, right? Tell the client to stop trigger foods, such as citrus fruits or juices and carbonated beverages. They're gonna to contribute to the acidity of the gastric juice and damage the esophagus further. And tell the client to stop items that reduce lower esophageal sphincter pressure and those include fats, caffeine, chocolate, alcohol, cigarette smoke, nicotine, peppermint, and spearmint, okay? So all of those make the door into the stomach less flush and make it more likely that the gastric juice is gonna pop up into the esophagus. Okay, this is a look at gastritis and peptic ulcer disease. This is Dr. Carlo Ogen medical director at Capital Regional Medical Center with Titan Emergency Room. Today I want to talk about gastritis versus peptic ulcer disease. Peptic ulcer disease is an open sore in the lining of the stomach. An infection in the stomach by H. pylori is the cause of most ulcers. Other causes include cigarette smoking, anti-inflammatory drugs such as ibuprofen, prednisone, and aspirin, and emotional stress. Acid blocker medicines will help to heal the ulcer in 6 to 12 weeks. If a bacterial infection is present, antibiotics will also be needed to keep the ulcer from coming back. As you can see in the picture, there is an erosion in the lining of the stomach going into the deeper layers of the stomach. When severe, a peptic ulcer can perforate, causing severe abdominal pain, pancreatitis, and becoming pretty ill. Gastritis is an irritation of the stomach lining without an ulcer. Causes include excessive alcohol, anti-inflammatory drugs, and spicy foods. The symptoms of these two diseases are very much alike, and most of the time, we can't tell the difference on emergency department analysis by itself. Further tests may be needed to tell them apart. Both will be helped by the following measures. Home care. Take any prescribed medicines for as long as directed. Finish them even if you begin to feel better sooner. Unless an acid blocker was prescribed, you may use over-the-counter drugs such as Pepsi AC, Zantac, etc. These begin to work within a few hours. Prilosec over-the-counter is a new type of acid blocker which may be more effective. It takes up to four days to take its full effect. You may get additional short-term relief by taking anti-acids like Melanta or Melanta. It should be taken one hour after meals and at bedtime. Gastritis may be worsened by foods that irritate the stomach. Follow a light diet until you're feeling better. Avoid the following aspirin and medicines that contain aspirin. Anti-inflammatory medicines such as ibuprofen and naproxen. Alcohol, caffeine, tobacco. Acidic foods such as tomatoes, and citrus, lemons, grapefruit, and oranges. Prednisone and related prescription drugs can cause an ulcer. Discuss with your doctor if you're taking any of these. Follow up with your doctor is very important. He can order further testing. He can refer you to a GI specialist for endoscopy if necessary. He can order a pylori testing to find out if your gastritis or ulcer is caused by these bacteria and whether or not you need antibiotic treatment. This specific diagnosis is not usually done in the emergency department. When to seek prompt or emergency medical attention. Stomach pain begins to get worse or moves to the right lower abdomen, the appendix area. Your abdomen becomes distended or swollen with frequent vomiting. You're not able to keep fluids or, or food down. If you have diarrhea, if you feel weak and dizzy, fainting, trouble breathing. If the pain starts to spread into your chest, back, neck, shoulder, or arm, you start vomiting with blood, red or black color, if there's blood in your stool. If by any means your condition deteriorates and you're not improving, do come back for reevaluation. We hope you get better soon, and we want to thank you for trusting your care to us here. God bless you. So, Gastritis literally means inflammation of the stomach, okay? 
Um, we see inflammation of the gastric mucosa. It gets congested with blood. It inflames. There's less acid produced and a lot of mucus. Ulcers can occur and that sometimes can lead to internal bleeding. So it can result from too many NSAIDs. Um, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which is what NSAID stands for, can thin the uh, mucus of the stomach and cause the stomach acid to be more corrosive on the stomach lining. It can be caused by bile reflux, ingestion of a strong alkali or acid, okay? Um, it can be a complication of radiation or chemotherapy or of trauma, okay? The reason for this is because in all of those situations, um, we're compromising the ability of the stomach lining to regenerate, okay? And the result then is gonna be um, erosion of the lining and damage. Gastritis occurs in the presence of ulcers, whether it be benign or malignant. Um, helicobacter is um, a contributing factor as we'll see. Um, helicobacter is a bacteria that can latch onto the stomach lining and colonize it and produce compounds that neutralize the stomach acid where the bacteria live, but then our own inflammatory process along with the corrosive action of the stomach acid can carve a hole in the stomach lining, causing it to bleed and potentially perforate. Okay. Autoimmune disorders can contribute, poor diet, a diet high in caffeine or alcohol, meds like alendronate and perindopril and a reflux of pancreatic secretions and bile into the stomach as well. Symptoms are abdominal pain, headache, lethargy, nausea, anorexia, hiccuping, heartburn, belching, a sour taste in the mouth. You might wonder, well, why is that? Well, acids have a sour taste. Think of citric acid that you have in like oranges and lemons and limes, okay? Vomiting, bleeding, and hematemesis, which is the vomiting of blood. Acute recovery typically occurs in a day, but can take longer. The client should eat a bland diet and be able to tolerate food. IV replacement is indicated if the condition persists. Because again, if the stomach is in, if the lining's in bad shape, we don't want to stress the lining further by having it have to process food, okay? So we cut down on the acid production by not having you eat through your digestive system and we give you nutrition through IV. When the condition occurs due to ingestion of strong acid or alkali, we've got to dilute or neutralize whatever you took, okay? So if you took in a lot of acid, we need to give you um, something that's basic. If you took in some base, we need to give you something that's acidic, okay? Um, we don't want to do lavage and emetics. A lavage or an emetic will cause the reflux of the stomach into the esophagus and can damage it very badly. That's one of the reasons why if you, if you ingest a corrosive, okay, you never want to induce vomiting because you're going to tear up the esophagus. What you want to do is, is neutralize what they've eaten, okay? Tell the client to stop eating frequent meals and snacks because they are going to increase acid production in the stomach and to stop alcohol, cigarette smoking, and the use of NSAIDs like naproxen and ibuprofen, okay? Cut down on black pepper and spicy foods because those are gonna to add to the inflammation and check for problems with the things that the, the stomach lining normally absorbs like B12 and iron, okay? Okay, this is a look at peptic ulcer disease. Normally, gastric juices are secreted in the presence of food. Stress and smoking can also cause the stomach lining to secrete gastric juices. In the absence of food, the acidic juices erode the lining of the stomach, leaving an open sore that may bleed. This open sore is called an ulcer. Recent research has shown, however, that a bacterium, Helicobacter pylori, may be a major factor in ulcer formation. The use of antibiotics to kill the bacteria has proved quite helpful in treating many patients with ulcers. So with an ulcer, you're talking about a bleeding wound in the stomach lining, okay? 
this can happen as a as a gastric ulcer in the stomach, a duodenal ulcer in the intestine, okay? And it can be caused by either helicobacter infection or the use of NSAIDs because the NSAIDs thin the alkaline mucus that's produced by the stomach lining. And so that removes some of this protection from its own acid. Some clients that have PUD don't have any symptoms and others have a dull pain, burning sensation in the back or the mid epigastric region, heartburn, constipation, diarrhea, sour taste in the mouth. There's that acid again. Burping, nausea, vomiting, bloating, um, tarry stools, eating temporarily relieves the pain and anemia can occur because of internal bleeding, okay? So what do we do? If it's caused by helicobacter, we give you the antibiotics, okay? Usually for about two weeks. Um, if it's not, if it's NSAIDs, then we cut down on the use of the NSAID. We tell you to use um, some other painkiller or treatment for inflammation. Um, the danger, of course, is that the, the ulcer could perforate. And if it perforates, then the gastric juice goes into the abdominal pelvic cavity and you start digesting your internal organs, okay? So that's an immediate emergency. Um, so tell the client to stop eating frequent meals, cut down on acid production and snacks. Tell the client to stop coffee, alcohol, caffeine, uh, black pepper, spicy foods. And then normally for drugs, we give you something called a proton pump inhibitor, which cuts down on acid production in the stomach in order to reduce the irritation and the bleeding that's going on at the site of the ulcer. Now, lactose intolerance is uh, an inherited disorder, meaning that you, you either have a lack of or insufficient production of an enzyme called lactase. The purpose of lactase is to cleave lactose into galactose and glucose and those monosaccharides can be absorbed across the stomach lining into the blood, but the lactose can't. So if you're missing the tool to break down the lactose, the lactose ends up making it all the way to your colon. And when that happens, the bacteria that live there use the lactose for fuel and they overgrow and they produce gas and pain and distension. Okay. So what do we do? Well, we we reduce your intake of lactose, right? So that means uh, cutting down on dairy or the other um, possibility is to have you take the lactase in pill form, okay? Either as a probiotic or as an enzyme that can be either in the food itself or it can be something that you take in addition to the food. And then you can break down the lactose and you do, utilize that for fuel, okay? Um, I want to check you for vitamin D deficiency and calcium again, because a lot of that is what you get through your dairy, right? And so if we have to limit your dairy, we're limiting those components in your diet as well. An ileostomy and a colostomy is a bypass surgery in which the material in the pipe gets shunted into a bag outside the body, which gets periodically changed, Okay. Fluid and electrolyte maintenance is a big concern for those that have ileostomies and colostomies. The colon absorbs large amounts of fluid and sodium and potassium. And so we have to watch those levels in the body. So nutrition therapy is going to begin with liquids and is going to slowly advance to solid food based on what the patient tolerates. Now, why do we do an ileostomy or colostomy? There's a variety of reasons, right? There's there's functional blocks in the digestive system, right? Where the peristalsis quits. And so um, we have to do a, a bypass. We have to remove the area that's not working and do a bypass into a bag, which can either be a temporary or permanent condition. Sometimes it's a result of cancer, right? If you have cancer in the GI, we have to remove that surgically. Then sometimes we have to do an ileostomy or colostomy um, until when and if we can rejoin the pipe, okay? So sometimes it's a permanent condition, sometimes it's temporary. So tell your client to have a diet that's high in fluid and fiber, stop foods that cause gas, um, stop foods that can block um, any passageway in the digestive system like nuts or carrots and foods that produce odor such as eggs or fish or garlic 
tell the client to increase the intake of calories and protein, and that promotes healing of the site of the stoma. That's where the bag is attached, okay? And allow emotional support, obviously, okay? This is a look at diverticulosis and diverticulitis. Diverticulosis is a condition in which small pouches grow in the lining of the colon and sometimes begin to bulge through the colon wall. A single pouch is called a diverticulum. The plural word is diverticula. Diverticulosis is therefore known as a diverticular disease. In 10 to 25 percent of cases, diverticulosis precedes a similar condition called diverticulitis. This disorder occurs when diverticula become inflamed. Let's take a look at some of the possible causes of diverticulosis. Although conclusive evidence is lacking, it appears diverticulosis may result from the lack of fiber in the patient's diet. Researchers have noticed that diverticular diseases became much more prevalent in the U.S. early in the 20th century when processed foods became more common. Processed foods generally have less fiber. The more processed foods you eat, the less fiber you get. Diverticular disease is also more common in developed or industrialized countries, which adds credence to the theory that low fiber diets promote diverticulosis and diverticulitis. Diverticular disease is rare in Asia and Africa, where people generally eat a lot more fiber. Symptoms of diverticulosis. Those who have diverticulosis generally don't experience any discomfort or symptoms. Occasionally, however, there could be mild cramping, bloating, and constipation. You should note, however, that some other problems like stomach ulcers and irritable bowel syndrome or IBS present similar symptoms, so diagnosis is not always that easy. Treating diverticulosis. Lifestyle changes are usually the best treatment for diverticulosis. Adding more fiber to the diet reduces diverticular problems, although mild pain medications may be prescribed in certain cases where abdominal pain or discomfort is present. If you have diverticulosis, it's important to make sure there's a lot of fiber in your diet. Fiber provides bulk and helps you move food through the colon. Good sources of fiber include oat bran, wheat bran, and of course, fruits and vegetables. Drinking a lot of water helps, and you may want to consider adding a fiber supplement such as ground flaxseed. This can be especially good for relieving constipation should it occur. If you're experiencing symptoms of diverticulosis, your best source of information, of course, is your doctor, and you should always only act on his or her advice. Meanwhile, though, here are some other resources you may find a bit helpful. Just click on the links below this video to get more information about them. So the diverticula are outpouchings of the intestine that result from weakness in the musculature of the lining of the digestive system. The problem with these is that they can plug with material and the bacteria that work on them can produce gas and pain and inflammation. And that leads to a condition called diverticulitis, okay? Symptoms include abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, constipation, diarrhea, chills, and tachycardia, similar to what you see in people with appendicitis, okay? So we give the client antibiotics, anticholinergics, and analgesics. Clients who've got severe symptoms are gonna be admitted to the hospital and treated with IV therapy. Opioid analgesics are administered for the pain, which is severe complications may warrant surgery, okay? So think of this as appendicitis times 100, okay? You've got all of these little blind sacks hanging off of the pipe and you can all have, they all have the possibility of plugging, okay? And this can happen in the large or the small intestine. A high fiber diet can reduce the symptoms of diverticulosis and diverticulitis by generating stools that are more easily passed and decreasing pressure in the colon. During acute diverticulitis, clear liquid diets are recommended until the inflammation goes away. So tell the client to stop foods that have things in them that could plug those sacs like seeds or husks, right? And then they're gonna have to have diet adjustment based on the need for intervention, right? So we need um, a high fiber diet, absent these seeds or husks and we need to have uh, uh, probably more frequent and smaller meals, okay? This is a look at inflammatory bowel disease.
Irritable bowel syndrome, or IBS, is a chronic condition affecting your large intestine. Your large intestine, also known as your colon, includes the cecum, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, rectum, and anal canal. The muscular wall of your colon contracts in a rhythmic fashion called peristalsis to move the intestinal contents toward your rectum. As it contracts, your colon absorbs water and nutrients from partially digested food moving through it. Waste material called stool is stored in the rectum until it is expelled through the anus as a bowel movement. With IBS, the muscular contractions of your colon are abnormal. In some cases, the contractions may cause food to move too quickly through your colon. As a result, your colon does not have enough time to absorb most of the water from your food. This condition leads to a watery stool and diarrhea. In other cases, the contractions may cause food to move too slowly. As a result, your colon absorbs too much water from your food. This condition leads to a hardened stool and constipation. It is unclear why your colon contracts abnormally. However, if you have IBS, your colon may be more sensitive to certain factors such as stress that seem not to affect most people. Other symptoms of IBS include abdominal pain and discomfort, bloating, gas, and cramping. You can manage your IBS symptoms through a combination of dietary habit changes, stress management, and medications. Eating food high in fiber creates softer, bulkier stools which may prevent spastic colon contractions. Fiber also helps relieve constipation. Stress management therapies, such as hypnotherapy and yoga, may help relieve your symptoms. Your doctor may prescribe medications to help manage your symptoms, such as anti-constipation drugs to help regulate your bowel movements, antispasmodic drugs to minimize muscle spasms and reduce pain, or sedatives and antidepressants to relieve anxiety and elevate your mood. So examples of these include Crohn's disease, where we have um, essentially uh, inflammation of regions of the small intestine, ulcerative colitis, and chronic inflammatory bowel diseases where sometimes the symptoms are extreme, that's exacerbation, and sometimes they resolve. So what do we see? Nausea, vomiting, cramps, fever, fatigue, uh, weight loss, steatorrhea, which is floating stool, that's because of the high fat content, and sometimes fever. Nutrition therapy is gonna be to provide nutrients in forms that the client can tolerate, Diets are usually low in fiber to minimize bowel stimulation. A low residue, high protein, high calorie diet with vitamin and mineral supplementation is important. Fluid and electrolyte imbalance is corrected with IV or oral replacement. Other therapies include sedatives, antidiarrheals like Imodium and antiperistalsics. Amino salicylate meds and corticosteroids reduce inflammation and immunomodulators are going to cut down on the inflammation. Surgery, when other treatments aren't effective, right? That's the last resort. So what do we do? Uh, nursing interventions are to teach the clients to stop the intake of anything that causes the diarrhea and to stop the use of nicotine. Sometimes we have to go to parenteral nutrition, which we'll learn about later in the course, and that's where we actually give the person all of their nutrient needs through IV, right? We bypass the digestive system entirely, okay? Here's a look at coleocystitis. Bile is stored in the gallbladder. 
Normally, the cholesterol in the bile remains in solution. Under certain conditions, the cholesterol may precipitate and form solid crystals. If this process continues, the crystals grow larger and become gallstones. The stones may block the flow of bile, causing pain and jaundice. Gallstones may be removed surgically. So basically what you've got are crystals in the gallbladder that can block it, right? The gallbladder normally concentrates the bile made by the liver so that it's better as an emulsifying agent. But what can happen if the crystals form is that you can block those pipes out of the gallbladder. And the danger, of course, is the gallbladder could rupture. So we see pain, tenderness, rigidity in the upper right abdomen. It can radiate to the right shoulder or the mid sternal region. That's referred pain. Nausea, vomiting, and anorexia can occur. If the gallbladder gets filled with pus or becomes gangrenous, it can perforate. It can basically rip. Okay. In clients who have large stones or an inability to control the condition with diet, we may have to do surgery, such as removing your gallbladder. Okay. Pancreatitis and liver can result from the production of gallstones because the gallstones can lodge in the area where the pancreatic and the bile duct come together, right? And if you block both pipes, what's going to happen is you're going to back up bile into the cystic duct that leads into the gallbladder, and that can cause it to rupture. And then for the pancreas, you're going to block the movement of pancreatic juice into the small intestine, and the pancreas can start to digest itself, right? So the diet's individualized to the client needs. Fat intake should be limited to reduce gallbladder stimulation. And other foods that can produce problems include coffee, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, onions, legumes, and foods that have a lot of seasoning or spice in them. This is a look at pancreatitis. Pancreatitis is a condition where there's just inflammation of the pancreas. It can be acute, meaning just comes on suddenly out of the blue, terrible searing upper abdominal pain, brings you to the hospital, and most people are admitted. But then there's another variety, it's called chronic pancreatitis, where there's just chronic inflammation of the pancreas, and people have chronic abdominal pain and go on for months to years. <laughs> You know, we know that heavy alcohol use is associated with chronic pancreatitis, but it turns out that's probably a minority of individuals. And what we're realizing is that many patients, whether they're age four or six or they're age 50, that they have unexplained chronic inflammation in the pancreas. The pain of chronic pancreatitis is probably one of the worst pains that people can have. Every meal that you eat makes the pain worse because when you eat, you turn on the pancreas. Probably the best analogy that I think most of my patients would say is that it's like 30 lit cigarettes dropped into your upper abdomen and left there to smolder. If the tests such as a CAT scan or MRI are abnormal, then that helps make the diagnosis. But in about 20, 30% of patients, those tests can be normal. And then the problem is, is how do you make that diagnosis? Blood tests are normal. So a lot is kind of sitting down with a patient, going through a careful history and trying to figure out is it other things or not. Here at Beth Israel Deaconess, we do this called secret in pancreatic function test. So if your CAT scan and MRIs have been normal, we do this other test. It's a relatively simple upper endoscopy procedure. We can rule in or rule out the diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis. Mm -hmm. 
I think it's important that we treat the pain these patients have, but one of the problems is do we put them on lots of narcotics? And there's a lot of issues with that. I think we should try to, to control the pain as much as we can, but when you start giving large amounts of narcotics, people get more used to them, and after a while, they don't work. We've been trying to look at other alternatives. So for example, if let's say someone says, go ahead, doctor, just cut out my whole pancreas. Well, you have a 50% chance you'll have your exact same pain of chronic pancreatitis. So even if you remove the whole pancreas, your brain is still getting the sensation that my pancreas hurts. And probably it's like phantom limb pain. Cut off your leg, you still feel it there because that sensation's been there so long. And that's our approach now with transcranial magnetic stimulation, this research study that we're doing. And it's just one approach where we're going after mechanisms in the brain and non-invasively try to modulate them. It's not the only approach though. Mind body, we have meditation that works for some people. Once in a while, things like celiac nerve blocks can work. And then some other medications will occasionally use. Eventually, the pancreas tends to quote, burn itself out, whatever that means. But usually people's pain, as mysterious as it started, just goes away. I think right now there aren't a lot of magical cures. My group has been one of the people in the country that's taken the lead on identifying what gene mutations are responsible for chronic pancreatitis. But there are, though, a lot of, a lot of potential hope some new avenues, we still have a long way to go, but at least we can potentially give someone the diagnosis of why they have chronic abdominal pain. Is it chronic pancreatitis? And if so, what's a thoughtful plan to really help that person and their family get back on keel and have somewhat of a normal life back? So an inflammation of the pancreas which is an accessory organ that makes bicarbonate and digestive enzymes to help us neutralize the stomach acid and then continue the process of breaking down our lipids and our carbs and our proteins. So we reduce stimulation of the pancreas. The client is prescribed nothing by mouth. An NG tube is inserted to suction gastric contents out. And then we go to TPN, which is basically giving them all their nutrients through IV, okay? Nutritional therapy uh, usually includes low fat, high protein and high carb diet. And it can involve providing supplements for C and B complex as well, okay? Liver is an accessory organ whose digestive function is to make bile and store it in the gallbladder. But its metabolic function, of course, is to adjust the uh, nutrient content of the blood and to engage in the production of non-essential amino acids, as well as simple sugars from its stored fat and its stored glycogen, okay? Um, malnutrition is common with liver disease. The protein needs are increased to promote positive nitrogen balance and stop the breakdown of the body's protein. Carbs are usually not restricted because they're an important source of calories. And this might lead to an increased um, uh, amount of calories based on their stage of their disease and their health status. Multivitamins and mineral supplements might be given and we eliminate alcohol, nicotine, caffeine. Um, again, liver disease is a blanket term, right? Cirrhosis is damage of the liver due to scarring, usually associated with excessive alcohol use. Hepatitis is inflammation of the liver that can either be via toxins or viral infection, okay? And of course, there's liver cancer, all right? Um, the idea, again, with um, the, the liver being compromised is you wanna take the load off of the liver, okay? So one of the liver's big um, job is, is to detoxify the blood, to detoxify alcohol, detoxify prescription and non-prescription drugs. And so that's why we eliminate a lot of that stuff. Okay. This is a look at celiac disease. 
conditions with celiac disease come in all shapes and sizes and of all ages, and they can be presented at any age. Well, celiac disease is a reaction of the immune system in the intestine to certain proteins, and the proteins come from wheat, barley, and rye. Those proteins, which we collectively term gluten, um, are generally considered something that is good for us, but for patients with celiac disease, and probably for some genetic reason, their immune system reacts against it and sets up a inflammation or damage in the lining of the intestine. And that's where we are trying to digest and absorb the gluten. But rather what happens is the gluten proteins set up this reaction. And in that reaction, we get damage to the lining of the small intestine. Now the small intestine is lined, and almost small intestine is lined with villi. Villi are like finger-like projections. And they're there really to maximize the amount of working area we have for digestion and absorption. And it's been said that if you could iron out the small intestine completely flat, that it would cover a tennis court. Now, of course, in celiac disease, if you lose all those finger-like projections and you get damage and it ends up being flattened, so you end up with an intestine that looks, instead of looking like a deep pile carpet, that looks more like a tile floor, then you end up with a surface area that's substantially small or maybe more like a table tennis table top, but a much smaller working surface area. Now, we know that's from work that we've done here, um, that celiac disease affects a variable amount of the small intestine. In some patients, it's just 1% of the intestine. In others, it can be 60 or 100% of the small intestine. And the consequences can be very variable. Some patients have terrific diarrhea, weight loss, if their young children failure to thrive, and they may be anemic, they may have um, severe osteoporosis because of lack of vitamin D and calcium. They may have um, other consequences of their, you know, they may have grown to a shorter height than they would have achieved other than having celiac disease. It can affect the permanent teeth and often dental loss is pretty common in patients with celiac disease. Um, but there are other patients who don't seem to get those same symptoms. They get problems like anemia, where they're maybe they've got low iron or Globin, especially if they can't respond to, you know, to oral iron. So their doctor tells them, take iron, but they don't respond. And it may be because they can't absorb the iron. And again, that could be a clue to celiac disease. Yeah. The treatment is safe. You know, going on a gluten free diet is a safe endeavor. It's not easy but because of how pervasive wheat, especially, is in our diet and all and there are many hidden ingredients that are made from that that can be a problem for somebody with celiac disease. It's certainly not an easy diet, not one that should be followed casually. A, a, a precise diagnosis is necessary to justify being on a gluten-free diet for life. Um, it can be socially restricting. It can um, make it more expensive. It certainly is more expensive to adhere to a gluten-free diet because you have to source foods in special ways, either by mail order or from special suppliers or from manufacturers that take great care to avoid contamination of their food. So that's an area that, to be on a gluten-free diet, doesn't just require, uh, let's say, self-teaching, go on the internet, you know, you know, look for information, but to, you know, really requires a, a consultation with an expert dietitian, somebody with expertise in celiac disease. Yeah, but I, I, think, I think to summarize, the most important thing is if somebody suspects they have it is to be tested before it's treated. The second thing is celiac disease is not a trivial disease associated with substantial complications. Now, one thing we didn't mention is there had been, it had been thought maybe 20, 30 years ago that people who had celiac disease as children could outgrow it. That's not the case. If somebody had a diagnosis as a child, and they, they almost certainly still have the disease, and they should be gluten free. Um, so this is an area where we've got new data, new information, it is rapidly changing. Um, but it's also one where I would see some the hope for the future in terms of finding the people who have got hidden celiac disease, understanding what that means in terms of their health, and giving people the tools who have celiac disease to live better lives and to be less, less socially restricted and be able to live a normal, essentially normal lifestyle with an interesting, varied, and healthy diet. If you have a family history of celiac disease, brother, sister, parent, or child with a disease, I think there's very good evidence that, that, that you should be tested for celiac disease. Um, if you've got premature osteoporosis, 
Certainly type 1 diabetes, it certainly should be considered. Uh, patients with unexplained infertility, a whole host of other ways in which they may actually occur. It can mimic irritable bowel syndrome, which is obviously much more common than celiac disease. Uh, again, it's a question of once the disease is suspected, a test should be performed before the diet is altered. But the big challenge is getting people to think about the diagnosis. So this is a problem with an allergy to a protein in wheat flour known as gluten, okay? And what happens is that you inherit this disorder and you generate these um, autoimmune antibodies that end up attacking the lining of the GI, right? Clients who have celiac cannot break down gluten uh, they lack the digestive enzyme DPP4, which is required to break the gluten into tinier molecules. So it ends up staying in the pipe, right? Uh, in celiac, the gluten gets broken down into peptides instead of um, amino acids and the body can't metabolize them. And if untreated, the client will get destruction of the lining of the intestine and the walls of the intestine. They can go undiagnosed in a lot, of, a lot of different patients. The symptoms depend on the individual. Children often have diarrhea, steatorrhea, which is again, floating um, stool due to the high fat content, anemia, abdominal distension, impaired growth, lack of appetite, fatigue. In adults, diarrhea, abdominal pain, bloating, anemia, steatorrhea, osteomalacia, which is basically um, the the adult version of rickets. The treatment is limited to avoiding gluten. Um, eliminating gluten in wheat, rye, and barley is tough because it's found in a lot of prepared foods. So clients have to read the label and adhere to the gluten-free diet. Some gluten-free products are unappealing and others are more expensive, uh, but the prognosis is good for clients that stay on that diet. Tell clients to eat foods that are gluten-free, including uh, dairy, rice, corn, eggs, potatoes, fruits, veggies, fresh meats, dried beans, and read the label on the product in order to avoid the presence of gluten, okay, which is in a lot more things than you think. And in addition to food products, it can be in things like lipstick and vitamin supplements. Um, so you have to be careful where... Um, where and what you eat. Okay. Now, bariatric surgery is a way to try and lose weight by reducing the size of the meals that you take in by changing the size of the stomach. Okay. So this includes lap band, um, gastric bypass, um, um, sleeves. Okay. What happens in all of these is that by reducing the size of the stomach, you, ho you hope to reduce the size of the meal and thus reduce uh, the deposits of fat in the body, right? Reduce the obesity, okay? So uh, post-operative complications um, for things like the uh, RUNY gastric bypass, where we, um, we, we basically skip part of the small intestine in addition to shortening the stomach, include uh, anastomotic leaks, internal hernias, GI bleeding, Stomal stenosis and gallstones, micronutrient deficiencies are also common long-term. Sleeve and, and gastric band or lap band are very similar. They just have a sleeve around the stomach that, that makes it tinier, right? Um, the surgery works best in combination with diet and lifestyle changes and tell the client that big changes in food intake and physical activity are important for weight control. So again, this is one of those things where if, if you're determined to take calories in, you can still do it, okay? Um, a lot of people continue to gain weight even after they've done lap band or um, sleeve by um, taking in liquid calories, right? Like, like milkshakes and stuff. And you can sneak those past the lap band and still take in a lot of calories without having the stomach expand too much. Um, so there's, there's ways around it. Um, 
in adjustable gastric band, what they have is a sleeve around there that you can adjust the amount of saline inside the sleeve and thus change the size of the stomach, right? Tell the client that their diet will, in an adjustable gastric band, increase from liquid to soft food and tell them the importance of chewing the food thoroughly and swallowing it and taking in tiny meals, okay, which is a huge change for somebody that was obese, okay? So does this work every time? And the answer is no, okay? Sometimes people undergo lap band and they either don't lose the weight or they get even heavier, okay? Um, you have to be able to stick to the diet and exercise routine in order for the lap band to do its work. And of course, you've all also got the extra complication of the fact that they had to go in there and do the surgery, right? They had to put something inside you by opening up the abdominal pelvic cavity. And that runs the risk of things like infection and uh, twisting, buckling, kinking, right? All of that is a possibility. So um, long story short, the, the best way to lose weight healthy is to reduce the calories you take in and increase your exercise levels. And I think we've discussed before that um, one of the most effective ways to do that is to go high fiber, high protein. This is for healthy individuals. Okay, let's take a, a 10 minute break and then I'll come back and finish up attendance. And then we're gonna talk about renal disorders, okay? So I'll see you in 10.
All right. We've talked about the kidneys a little bit. Um, their main job is to clean the blood and to maintain fluid and electrolyte balance and control the body's pH, blood pressure, and the rate at which we make red blood cells, a process called hematopoiesis, okay? The kidney received blood from the renal artery comes off of the descending aorta, and that goes through the kidney tissue and then re-enters the blood through the renal vein into the inferior vena cava, okay? Um, the functional unit of the kidney, the nephron, is made up of uh, several parts, okay? The nephron has a glomerulus inside a Bowman's capsule, which leads to a proximal convoluted tubule, okay? Which leads to the loop of Henle, which leads to a distal convoluted tubule, which leads to something called a collecting duct, which empties into a chamber in the kidney um, called the minor calyx, which empties into the major calyx and then into the renal pelvis. And then the ureters are gonna take the urine ultimately to the bladder, okay? So let's take a look at, well, actually, before we do that, let me, let me do something real quick here. Okay. All right, that's better. So. One of the primary functions of the kidney is better understood at the level of the nephron. Forming urine, the nephron functions to remove metabolic wastes from blood while regulating the volume and composition of body fluids. Urine formation begins in the renal corpuscle, where blood passing through the glomerulus is filtered. Filtrates include water, ions, and other solutes, which are filtered out of the blood and into the capsular space to begin urine formation. Urine passes into the proximal convoluted tubule, then into the nephron loop. The nephron concentrates urine by the process of the countercurrent multiplication system. The countercurrent multiplication system is basically the means by which water and sodium are extracted from the filtrate as it passes through the tubules toward the collecting ducts. This system is called countercurrent because of the dynamics set up by the hairpin turn of the loop of Henle. The direction of flow in the descending limb of the loop is opposite from the direction of flow in the ascending limb. By flowing in opposite directions in such close proximity, a unique interaction occurs. The loop of Henle dips from the cortex of the kidney into the medulla and is surrounded by the medullary interstitial fluid. The countercurrent multiplication system is responsible for not only elevating the concentration of urine in the loop, but more importantly, it elevates the concentration of the interstitial fluid as well. To explain the countercurrent multiplication system, we must first imagine the loop filled with a stationary column of glomerular fluid, which includes water, salt, and urea. At first, the concentration of the glomerular fluid and the surrounding interstitial fluid will be equal at an osmolarity of 300 milliosmoles. Within the walls of the thick segment of the ascending limb, special pumps extract salt, sodium chloride, from the fluid and transport it to the interstitium. The two areas no longer have an equal osmotic pressure and a gradient has been established. Within the thick segment, the concentration is at 200 milliosmoles, whereas in the medullary tissue, the concentration is at 400 milliosmoles. 
Over time, a net diffusion of salt into the descending limb and a net diffusion of water out of the descending limb results in a balance in osmolarity between the descending limb and the surrounding interstitium. Because the thick segment is still actively pumping out salt, the osmolarity of the ascending limb is still 200 milliosmoles, and the interstitium and descending limb are balanced at 400. Salt accumulates in the medulla while water is drawn out of the fluid in the descending limb. Water is removed by the vasa recta, which are capillaries that surround the loops. In real life, operation of this gradient occurs while the fluid is flowing. Fluid flowing in from the proximal tubule and out to the distal tubule along with the constant pumping of salt into the medulla contributes to the multiplication of this gradient. As fluid follows the path of the loop, an increasing amount of water is extracted as it reaches the bottom, and an increasing amount of salt is pumped out as the fluid reaches the top. The more salt pumped out, the higher the concentration in the medulla. The higher the concentration in the medulla, the more water is extracted. Eventually, the levels of osmotic pressure are equal horizontally, with the highest value being at the tip of the loop. This level is at 1,400 milliosmoles per liter, which is also the value of the maximal osmolar of excreted urine. As you can see, fluid becomes more concentrated as it rounds the loop, but it immediately becomes re-diluted as it reaches the top. Final concentration of the fluid occurs in the collecting ducts as it must travel back through the concentrated interstitium of the medulla on its way to the calyces. Urine is concentrated even further in the collecting ducts. The collecting duct must transport urine back through the concentration gradient formed by the nephron loop. The walls of the collecting duct are permeable to water, but not to salt. Therefore, an increasing amount of water is drawn out by osmosis as the fluid travels through the gradient. The gradient provides the force for the concentration of urine, but the rate is determined by the amount of antidiuretic hormone, ADH, in the blood. An increase in ADH in the blood causes the collecting ducts to become more permeable to water. Less urine is secreted and it is more concentrated. A decrease in ADH results in a decrease in water removed, thus a larger volume of more dilute urine is excreted. Urine is formed by three processes in the nephron, the functional part of the kidney. In glomerular filtration, the glomerulus filters water and certain dissolved substances from the plasma of the blood. This results in increased blood pressure, which forces the plasma-like fluid from the blood into Bowman's capsule and then into the tubules. The fluid or filtrate include many positive and negative ions of many elements. The filtrate does not have any proteins or red blood cells, which are too large to pass through the capillary membrane. In tubular reabsorption, substances are transported out of the tubules and back into the blood of the peritubular capillaries. Reabsorption takes place in the proximal tubule, loop of Henle, and distal tubule. The major part of reabsorption occurs in the proximal tubule. About 15% of water is reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. The process is regulated by the hormones vasopressin and aldosterone. In tubular secretion, substances move from the plasma in the peritubular capillaries back into the filtrate in the renal tubules. The proximal tubule secretes creatinine and histamine, and the distal tubule and collecting duct secrete potassium into the filtrate. All the tubules actively secrete hydrogen ions to regulate the pH of the body fluids. The filtrate is now urine. Urine is about 95% water with a balanced urea, uric acid, amino acids, and electrolytes. The daily production is about 0.6 to 2.5 liters per day. Urine production below 30 milliliters per hour indicates possible kidney failure. So your kidneys clean your blood, maintain your fluid balance and pH, control the rate at which you make blood, maintain your blood pressure, okay? And if both your kidneys were to fail and we didn't do anything about it, you'd have about two days to live because the toxins would build up in your blood so much that your, um, your proteins, the tools of life would denature and those functions would stop. And the membrane potential, which helps to drive transport 
in every cell in your body would be destroyed. Okay. So kidneys are absolutely critical to your survival, right? Um, the, um, the kidneys are located at the level of the floating ribs near the lumbar spine. Okay. And they're towards the posterior body wall. And as a result, they don't have a lot of protection, which is one of the reasons why in sports, you're not allowed to hit people there. Okay. It's considered a personal foul or, um, basically grounds for ejection. Okay. The, um, levels of urea are going to rise when the kidneys start to lose their function and urea is going to denature protein and it's going to begin to accumulate in the blood and then throughout the body. What is it that can damage the kidneys? Well, there are, um, there are infectious diseases, there's trauma, there are birth defects, and then there are certain medications, right? So the different types include chronic kidney disease, acute kidney injury, end-stage kidney disease, nephrotic stem syndrome, and kidney stones. Renal function can't be taken over by another organ. So if you have to, um, if you lose kidney function, we have to put you on a process known as dialysis. Okay, there's two kinds of dialysis, um, hemo and peritoneal dialysis. In hemodialysis, we um, basically um, put a, a needle in a vein in your arm, and then we take that blood and we pass it through a tube of dialysis membrane, which is bathed in dialysis fluid, and we dilute out the waste products through diffusion, okay? And this takes between three and four hours. You have to do it three to four times a week, okay? Where in peritoneal dialysis, what happens is that you can do this at a hospital or at home. Um, we put a port in the abdominal pelvic cavity and then we fill it with dialysis fluid and then the blood vessels in the peritoneum leak the toxins into the dialysis fluid and then we drain that fluid off and then we do another fill and drain and then after we've done that you're good for about two days and the advantage of peritoneal is that you can do it at home with minimal equipment and you don't have to move the patient very much okay in hemodialysis means you've got to go to a clinic okay Continuous ambulatory peritoneal is just a variation in which the patient is standing up. They're constantly hooked to a dialysis bag. And so uh, essentially that's, that's their kidney, okay? And what's happening is that the, the, uh, the, the dialysis fluid is, is flowing into a port and then is flowing out, okay? And so we periodically change the bags. The cure is a kidney transplant, but in order for that to happen, you have to have a tissue match between somebody who um, is usually a, a close relative, like a, a child or a first cousin or a brother or a sister or a parent, okay? Um, the odds of a stranger being a tissue match for you are very remote, okay? So this is why most kidney transplants are what we call from living related donors, okay? And generally what happens when you receive a kidney transplant is that you end up at the end of the procedure with three kidneys. You, get, you have the two that are your kidney, and then you have the third kidney, which is the donor kidney. And then you can get by as the donor with just one functioning kidney, that's fine. And that's in the case that the kidney isn't cancerous or infected, okay? Um, as a physician, we have to monitor your weight because that's an indication of your fluid retention um, so we have to monitor the fluid intake, the compliance, the output, and we have to look at constipation. And then we have to talk to them about why we have to change their diet, right? We have to change the amount of protein. We have to cut that down, okay? We have to change the amount of calories and sodium and phosphorus and other vitamins. The idea here basically is to take the load off the kidney, okay? So chronic kidney disease is staged by increasing creatinine and decreasing glomerular filtration rates, right? The glomerulus is the cluster of capillaries where the blood that comes in to the kidney through the renal artery gets pushed through a series of cell layers and into this little capsule called the glomerulus that leads into the nephron, okay? And um, the rate at which we do that is called the GFR or glomerular filtration rate. 
in stage one, you're at risk. Stage two is mild. Stage three is moderate. Stage four is severe. And stage five is end stage kidney disease. Leading causes are diabetes mellitus and hypertension. Now, why? Okay. Well, in diabetes mellitus, you can't control your sugar levels, all right, either because you don't make insulin or you aren't sensitive to your insulin. And so what that does to the filtration units in the kidneys is that that makes them have to work harder to put sugar back into the blood. All that sugar can't go back into the blood, so a lot of it stays in the urine and you start to lose extra fluid, so you dehydrate. So the um, manifestations of diabetes mellitus are glycosuria, ketonuria, um, and um, a, um, a high specific gravity, as well as polydipsia, which is constant thirst, and polyuria, which is constant urination, okay? Um, the damage is done primarily at the proximal convoluted tubule and the Bowman's capsule um, because the high pressure that often accompanies diabetes damages the filtration membrane and the extra sugar makes it harder for the proximal convoluted tubule to do its job. And so a lot of those nephrons can end up shutting down, okay? Hypertension is, is a similar risk factors, right? Because of the high blood pressure, you damage the filtration apparatus, you start to leak stuff into the urine that shouldn't be there, like red blood cells, white blood cells, protein, other nutrients, okay? And that ends up affecting your health, okay? It's more common in African and Native Americans and Latin Americans. What do we do about it? We control blood sodium and blood pressure, right? Sodium is going to act to pull water towards it, okay? So the less sodium we have in your system, the less water we're going to retain, okay? We slow down the progression of the disease this way and we preserve any remaining function you've got. Phosphorus and protein intake also is going to slow the progression of chronic kidney disease because that's one of the jobs of the kidney is control phosphate levels, right? We limit high phosphorus foods to one serving or less per day. In men with uh, meat, women, men take between five and six ounces of meat a day, women around four, okay? Dairy, half a cup, okay? Too little protein can result in breakdown of body protein. So we have to be careful here and walk the line between the kidney's chemical processing of amino acids, all right, which it has a role in along with the liver and the um, kidney's ability to clear the waste out of the blood, okay? We wanna restrict potassium in order to prevent hyperkalemia, that's high potassium levels. In end-stage kidney disease, creatinine level is way up, GFR is minimal, and we've got you on dialysis and you're waiting for a transplant, okay? So we have to consider sodium and fluid management. We have to have adequate protein and calorie intake. We have to manage your potassium and phosphorus and monitor your vitamin D levels, okay? In acute kidney injury, we have an abrupt decline of kidney function that is often reversible, okay? Diet therapy for AKI is dependent on the underlying cause. Protein, calorie, fluid, potassium, and sodium are individualized according to the phase. Generally, these things are reduced in the diet. Potassium and sodium levels depend on what you're showing in the urine and the lab values um, and whether or not you're on dialysis. And the protein intake is based on whether or not you've, you're on dialysis. If you're on dialysis, then we can keep your protein intake pretty close to normal. Calcium requirements, about two grams a day if you're on dialysis, okay? Nephronic syndrome is a different type of condition. Uh, Sometimes you go to a pediatrician and the kid's eyes are a little bit puffy and he's doing a urine. I said, wait a minute, I, 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 the eyes are puffy. Why is he doing a urine? And he notices just protein in the urine, and he's sending it to you. Here I thought I had an eye problem. He looks at urine, and you see the kid. I don't see, this doesn't make any sense to me. Can you make some sense out of this? I try. 
The question is why the child has swelling around the eyes. The mother may think it's um, some eye problem or could be an allergy. However, this is a sign of swelling, what we call edema. And when we have edema, kidneys could be responsible. To make a long story short, the kidney filters the blood, but it, it does not allow the protein to go into the urine. If there's protein in the urine, or a huge amount of protein in the urine, that means that the, ki ki the kidney has a problem. The kidney cannot keep the protein, the kidney goes, the protein goes into the urine, the protein in the blood goes slow. When the protein in the blood goes slow, that causes swelling everywhere. The first place or the, the, the place where you notice is around the eyes. So when you see uh, a child that has swelling around the eyes, think that this could be a kidney problem, that the kidney may be losing protein, and that's what we need to... Are there any other areas you could look for the swelling that also be indicative of well, this? The swelling uh, can happen in many different areas, but you can notice it on the legs, on the legs, on the feet, um, the, the lower extremities. You can you can see some distension of the abdomen. The fluid can 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 accumulate in, in the abdomen, and um, the back sometimes the back? yeah, sometimes you can have it in the back as well. Um, um, so the, 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 everywhere, obviously, it, it, if it's very severe, can also cause swelling of the scrotum. Swelling of the genital area in fe in females, and also can accumulate inside the body. Obviously, you cannot see that, but the the, the, the fluid can accumulate everywhere. They have a term for this. What's that term called? When the kids have this kind of condition where they get the swelling in the eyes. Well, they, they when when have swelling of, of of the everywhere, we call nephrotic syndrome or nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic syndrome. Is that a common disease? It's not a common disease. Um, but we have to be aware of it. Uh, as nephrologists, it's common for us. Uh, it's not as common for a, for a general pediatrician. A pediatrician should be aware that a child with periorbital swelling, they should think first of the kidney because it's, a, it's an important uh, disease and you need to address it and you need to treat it. It can be treated. How, how do we treat that? The treatment of this um, nephrotic syndrome, usually we give a medication. Is there any particular hallmark of medicine? We, we use steroids, we use prednisone. Okay. Or, That's or, a good thing because it can stop this process? Prednisone, um, in the majority of children, there are different, uh, nephrotic syndrome is a huge term with many causes, but the most common in children, and uh, this happens in children, from starting at age two, age three, age four, age five, they get this nephrotic syndrome where prednisone works very well, stops the protein in the urine. If the protein, if, the, if there's no protein in the urine, the protein in the blood goes up again, puts the system in balance again, and the swelling around the eyes and the swelling uh, all around the body disappears and gets better. Is this a lifelong problem or a temporary problem? It's an interesting, it's a good question. Um, in the majority of children, it's not a lifelong problem, but it's not a self-limited, quick problem. Um, it's not temporary. It may take a while, may take months, may take years to resolve. In other words, you treat, it gets better, but a couple of months later, that can happen again, and it's important for the parent to know that this is a recurrent problem that over time, over the, over the years, it, 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 it will get better. Usually it gets better, but it may take a couple of years. Because we use so much prednisone with this, you should have a problem now. You can't quite give live vaccines like measles and chickenpox to kids in big doses of prednisone. So we have to sort of delay that a little bit, don't we? That, 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 is, correct. that okay. is correct. The other vaccines probably are okay, is that mm -hmm. correct? Yes, but uh, we have to wait. I mean, wait. So we have to wait to the kids that are a, a remit stage off the prednisone for a month or so, or whatever it is, and then try to get the vaccine in. Can the vaccines make this condition worse? 
bothers you now? Um, no one really knows. No, I, 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 I'm not sure about it. Okay. Are there any medicines that can make this condition worse? Medicine that can make the condition worse. Okay. Um, we talk about the nephrotic syndrome. Yeah. I, I'm not really sure um, if that's the case. The general rule, the only real thing you're concerned about when you're using steroids, there are complications. Sometimes they get puffy a different way, but you can't live live vaccines if you're on the big dose steroids. There are some doses that are small maintenance. Sometimes you can, but you always got to check with the makers of MMR and Verisol, which is Merck, and they have some guidelines to get doctors through it, but that's the biggest concern. Sometimes you get the first year in, and the kid gets it at three, and now you're on steroids. The kid's four, and the school wants the kid to have a, a second dose of MMR, and very soon they want a second dose of Verisol. It's just a little bit of a, a problem. You're right. You're right. But I think most schools would understand that if you can't do it when you have a medicine like prednisone. Mm -hmm. But generally, most kids do reasonably well with this condition. Is that correct? That is correct. Are there any more type of group of people more prone to nephrotic syndrome than any other group that you have seen in your experience? It's interesting um, that nephrotic syndrome, it's, 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 it's a great question and with the, the different answers. Sometimes children with allergies may get more. Um, some children, I mean, in, some children with... Um, Ethnicity may play a factor sometimes, and um, but boys and girls, more boys. More well, it's girls. usually usually more boys get more the boys. Family syndrome. That's why women live longer; they get less diseases than us. I don't know the answer. You know the answer to that. Uh, thank you. So we see protein loss, right? Um, this leads to protein malnutrition, anemia, vitamin D problems. Contributing factors, diabetes, kidney damage because of meds, autoimmune problems, and infection. So what do we do? We try to minimize the swelling by replacing lost nutrients and preventing protein malnutrition, sufficient protein, and we keep low sodium to, re to reduce fluid retention. So we do soy-based protein, carbs are the majority of the calories, limit the trans fats. Total fat is over 30% of the daily diet and multivitamin supplements to replace loss of vitamins with loss of protein. And here's a look at kidney stones. Kidney stones, also called nephrolis, are deposits of mineral salts called calculi in the kidney. These stones can pass into the ureter, irritate kidney tissue, and block urine flow. Kidney stones are one of the most common and painful disorders of the urinary tract. Approximately 10% of people in the United States will have a kidney stone at some point in their lives. A person with a family history of kidney stones may be more likely to develop stones. Most frequently, the cause of kidney stones is hypercalciuria, where calcium is absorbed from food in excess and is lost into the urine. Urinary tract infections, kidney disorders, and metabolic disorders, such as hyperparathyroidism, are also linked to stone formation. Most kidney stones pass out of the body without any intervention by a physician. Stones that cause lasting symptoms or other complications may be treated by various techniques, most of which do not involve major surgery. People with a history of kidney stones should drink enough fluid to produce at least two quarts of urine daily. People prone to forming calcium oxalate stones may need to cut back on food and drink that contain oxalate, such as cola, coffee, tea, chocolate, spinach, strawberry. So these are crystals that form, they can form in the uh, renal pelvis, they can form in the ureter, okay? and they block the flow of urine from the kidney to the bladder, and they're extremely painful. Um, it radiates through the abdominal pelvic cavity and down into your, your groin, okay? And it's usually the result of not enough water, not taking in enough water, uh, high pH in the urine, and um, 
too much oxalate. Oxalate is something that you find in green vegetables such as uh, spinach and kale, okay? So what do we do? We limit the intake of animal protein, sodium, calcium, and foods that have oxalate in them. And those are listed here, okay? Um, we increase fluid intake between one and a half to three liters of water uh, around bedtime. And that's to help dissolve the stones if they, or the crystals if they try to form, right? Crystals form when the, the concentration of the calcium gets too high, right? So if you dilute it with water, it's less likely to happen. You limit the foods that contain the oxalate because those contribute to the formation of the crystals. And a low potassium level can also be a risk factor. Avoid high doses of vitamin C because again, that has oxalate in it and prevent um, foods that are high in purines. Um, so you wanna stay away from lean meats, organ meats, whole grains and legumes, okay? And those are for uric acid stones. So usually when you have a kidney stone, um, what the doctor will do is give you a, a big dose of painkiller and he'll tell you to drink a lot of water to try and clear the stone and he'll make you pee into a strainer for about two weeks and catch the stone. And then you bring the stone into his office and stone gets analyzed for what's in it. And then you make your appropriate recommendations, right? If it's a it's calcium stone, then we you cut your spinach, your um, your caffeine, your your chocolate, your tea and all that. If it's a uric acid stone, then we take the same precautions that we would take if we were trying to avoid um, gout, okay? Which is the formation of uric acid crystals in, in the joint cavities, okay? Bottom line, if you wanna avoid this is to stay well hydrated, all right? Keep drinking at least the minimum amount of water every day so that the stones have less of an opportunity to form, right? Okay, uh, that brings us to an end for today. Um, I will send you guys the link to the lecture. We don't have any homework this week. Um, and like I said, I will get those, um, those exam grades up once the remaining exams are in, okay? Um, next week. I got a question. Yes, ma'am. What's the question? <laughs> I lost you. What was the question? question yeah what's the question you keep <laughs> what was the question See, you I'm don't not, put the grades in and i already got it. I, I heard a piece of what you said um I'm waiting for the rest of the exam grades to come in so that I know whether or not I need to make any adjustments if any questions were um, either incorrectly uh, written or whether um, they were, they scored poorly, poorly because they weren't adequately covered in class. Okay. So that's why I'm waiting. Okay. So I have to get the rest of the exams in or do that. Okay. Next week, we're going to be talking about vitamins, okay? And we will have a assignment that I will uh, email you guys. And um, I'm also going to post the stuff that I emailed you today, the notes for this lecture, up on the website as well, okay? All right. Uh, time to bump out. Unless anybody has any questions, we're good. Mr. Converse, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. I sent you three emails on Sunday and I never received um, anything back from you. Uh, regarding what? It was regarding the exam. Yeah. Uh, were you able to get in and take it? It wasn't saving my answers. Um, I see a score for you. if your answers aren't getting saved. If there's like no response on some of them, what I will do is I will pop it for you again and you can take it again. Make sure that when you take the exam, uh -huh. that you take it 
take it using Chrome as your browser or, or Firefox. All right. Okay. Don't try and take it on your phone. All right. Because it might not save your stuff on your phone. Okay. okay. So that could be a problem with the browser as well. But I will look before I post. Okay. 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 This is Raleesha Harris. That happened to me too. Okay. It, it didn't save some of your answers. Right. I will not, look over. I emailed stuff. you too, but I, I don't know. If yeah. So it. I'll look over that and make sure that um, every answer has a response. Okay. So if that's a problem, um, I will definitely pop that again and you let you take it again. And just remember to use um, Chrome or Firefox as the browser. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Cool. All right.